All right, mahalo, mahalo. All of you guys for joining us here in the Kuka Kuka tent. We're going to start get started with our second panel. They call him I for the crying uh, boy back there. That's my son, Tautua, five years old. Love you, son. Be good. Mahalo to all the parents to so the Makua who bring their keiki here to Lahoi Hoi Ea. It's within this normalization that we're going to strengthen our Lahui. Yeah, and we're going to be empowered and our, our next generation and the ones after that are going to help move us forward. Okay, my son. Um, so without further ado, let me just introduce our panel speakers. What we're going to do is we're going to give each speaker 12 to 15 minutes to share some of their story. Oh, and that's my wife, Helena. Thank you, babe. Share some of their stories. And then um, at the end, we'll have a, a opportunity for you guys to ask some questions, do a little Q&A. I'll, I'll facilitate that. Um, and really what the goal and purpose is here is that within this system that we got going on, many of us have, have found a need to create our own economic independence, our own systems to try to uphold uh, some of the values that, that we believe in. And so wanted to share some of these opportunities. So the first speaker, she's a great friend. Aloha Aina, and she's got an awesome, awesome uh, Lahala weaving business. Her name is Pula Malong. Let her introduce herself. Sorry, call my No, no. Aloha Mai Kako. Uh, mahalo Josh for uh, creating this panel. Uh, so I'm just going to briefly talk a little bit about how my business was created, but I want to focus more on the that I'm doing in connection to Aloha Aina and then kind of go from a broader perspective and talk about entrepreneurship and the path um, to be an independent Lahui. So kind of just to talk about the creation of my business, um, my business is Honi Hala and um, I've been growing it for about two and a half years and I first me Pulama, um, I am a Hawaiian diaspora so I was born and raised in Washington State and I moved to Hilo in 2007 to just um, be with my grandma and I took some Hawaiian classes at Hawaii Community College. And that really started my journey into who I was as a Hawaiian, my identity, culture, language, aina, and all of those things. Um, through time, transferred to UH Manoa where I got my degree in Hawaiian studies. Um, and it really was the kumu and the mentorship in that, in that institution that really put me into where I am today. Um, and the support system was amazing. And that's where I started my weaving genealogy was under Hawaiian studies. And so I started to grow this liking. I'm a very hands-on creative person, so I really took interest into this cultural practice. But there were some things I was noticing when I graduated to try and reach out and gain more knowledge in the community is two things. One, there wasn't that many opportunities to learn how to weave um, that were accessible and affordable um, to me at that time. And another one is, those spaces that I did get to go in, in weaving um, and gaining that knowledge, there wasn't a lot of young people. Um, there was always about like a handful of us that were interested. So it really repositioned my kuleana into um, trying to provide space and trying to contribute to the growth and the perpetuation of this cultural practice. Um, and the longevity of ulana lauhala being something that we see in future and future generations. And so that kind of took me on this path of, well, what do I want to do? How can I ensure that and be a contributor to that? And so I started teaching and I got opportunities, even though I was a young weaver myself, to teach um, and to be in those spaces. And through the best way to learn is to teach. And that pushed me um, in knowing what I was talking about, how I was articulating it, and how to be very clear to the learner of what I was doing. Um, and then it kind of, I wanted to grow something on my own. I wanted to do workshops. I wanted to be that accessible person in the community for people who were interested in weaving. I really wanted to bring in these different aspects of what we think of Aina as. So Aina is that which feeds. Um, so we automatically think of food, but I also wanted to bring in how Aina also feeds us spiritually, emotionally, um, with knowledge. And so this is kind of that framework of all of these different aspects 
to look at um, weaving and our connection to Aina and deepen that aloha for it in general. Um, and I do have participants who are not Hawaiian. But again, it, when we think about the Lahui, we're very, we're inclusive and knowing that their genealogy, that they're adding that mo'olelo to their own gene genealogy as well. Um, so that's very important that it's on a broader level and for what people are understanding. Now to kind of switch into entrepreneurship as a whole um, and how I feel it can be used in movements of independence. Um, for us as entrepreneurs and for those out there who want to get into that and start to create their own business, I feel like it's very important for us that we stick together and that we promote each other, support each other, buy each other's stuff, share knowledge with each other, and let that be a community within a community to strengthen ourselves um, in knowing that we are standing on an independent platform. What we're doing is, and what we're creating um, will help us in our lahui as a whole, yeah? When we can get our money circulating within our communities, where we can become more in independent from other avenues and we're really being the creators and building up each other. And I think that's really important as entrepreneurs. Um, and then the, the second thing, if you are starting a business or just in anything that you do, is constantly asking the question of how do you, how are you serving your community and how is your community benefiting? And this is something that I always keep asking myself at being the forefront of how I move forward in my business. So when I mean community, I mean not just people, but Aina and resources. How am I serving that? How am I benefiting that? Um, and what are the practices that I'm doing and using and what I'm creating that supports that and has a strong foundation? Um, and those things are very important to me because when we think about serving the community, um, helping and supporting each other, that then we start to get into building power. Um, and when I say power, I don't mean the Western aspect of power, but when I mean power is I mean that we are building the visions we wanna see for our community. We are building our own destiny. We are building ways that we can more connect and come together. And that's the kind of power that we need in becoming more independent as a Lahui. So, um, and that's different from taking power, yeah? When we're taking power, we're taking from the oppressive system that is holding all the power. And there's space for that too, and that's tactful. That's what we're doing right now, yeah? We're reclaiming this space, and that's taking power. But we're also building power at the same time because we're creating an event where us as a community can come together, recognize each other, build relationships with each other um, with a clear, um, understanding of what we're trying to get to yeah so it works in similar ways but for me my concentration is how can i best build power um with the with what i'm doing and what i'm bringing to the community now with all of that said i'm going to kind of wrap up and end with um it's really important when you're on this path and you're thinking about all these things community um visions and how to deliver that, you're putting yourself out there for people, is to really think about um, and be conscious of self-care and self-health. Um, especially when you're building a business, it's really hard. You are everything, yeah? You are the person creating, you are the photographer, you are um, the promoter, uh, you are all of these things. So if it gets too overwhelming and gets too stressful, it's very important to take a step back and step away from it and occupy your mind with something else. Um, because when you come back into that work environment, you have a clearer head and a clearer focus. And when I'm saying it to you guys, I'm saying it to myself. <laughs> because it is very hard for me. I go to work during the day, I work at Pai Pai, I come home and I'm working at night, yeah? And so that's very consistent within my life. And so, it's good to um, just be, be self-aware of that, especially when we're thinking on a path of independence. And for me personally, the extent of where I want us to go as a Lahui with independence, cannot, I cannot get there if I am not healthy and I'm not thinking about my own self-health. Um, so that's definitely a huge part of it. Mahalo.
Okay, so Josh has delegated my introduction to myself, so I'm just... <laughs> That's fine. My name is Ikaika Hussey, and um, so... Let's see. I... Um, what are we talking about? Business. Okay, so... <laughs> I published... Thank you. Uh, so 22 years ago, um, I was... So I'm, I'm, I'm very fortunate because I was able to graduate from high school at a time when Hawaiian politics was very hot. It was on the, the front page of every, um, every newspaper. Every, we were all the time having a conversation about sovereignty. And so I graduated in 96. Um, I remember the, um, the, the historic march celebrating the centennial of the overthrow or you know, on recognizing the centennial of, of the overthrow. And I think that we've actually we've won a critical issue, which is whether or not the overthrow was just, whether or not it was okay. You know, I think about the fact that in 2009, there was the 50 years, uh, you know, since statehood, the fact that there wasn't a huge celebration was in many ways a recognition of the unjust, the, uh, the injustice of the overthrow, the entire statehood process. And it's really quite remarkable to me, um, the ways in which we have, we as a people have won this kind of historic um, and historical question about the overthrow. Um, but I, you know, so in the 1990s, it was such a current question. Um, there, was, there was a lot of things happening. Um, and I got deeply involved in, in the movement at the time in the, in the late 90s. And a lot of times my job was to be the guy who would go and talk to the press about why we're protesting over here, you know? Why are all these Hawaiians standing here with signs? And I, it was my job to go and educate the, the press. Um, for instance, there was, for a while, the Honolulu Advertiser had hired um, a really bright young reporter from Jordan. And who, she had no context for Hawaii's history. No, she had never studied Hawaii's history, which makes sense, she grew up in Jordan. Um, and so I spent a lot of my a lot of my time was spent just kind of educating, just basics. You know, this was this is what happened in 1893, in you know 1918, uh, 1959, etc. Um, and I I came to realize the degree to which our politics was driving the conversation um, for the entire state, but fundamentally the ways in which we were being treated as if we were the problem. You know. Uh, in, instead of the, the newspaper asking the, the questions that we were asking, you know, why is this land not accessible to us? Why is this water not able to flow into the streams? Um, the, the paper would talk about the protest, but not about the, the fundamental core issue. And so I realized there is actually a really important role for the media in terms of educating the general public. The media often, I believe, is so, sort, of like an, it's sort of like public education. It's a way to educate the, the community about whatever the issue is. So, um, uh, let's see, nine years ago, I started a small um, a newspaper online called the Hawaii Independent. And then four or five years ago, we launched a, uh, a small magazine called Summit Magazine, named for the motto of Queen Kapi'olani. Uh, but I'd like, actually, I would like to talk the, for the remainder of my time, not about my small role as an entrepreneur, but really about the role of economics in our community. Um, I think a lot of times we rightfully talk about 1893 and the overthrow, et cetera, but I think we should remember that the overthrow actually started 50 or 60 years prior to that. It started with the slow incursion of plantations into our lands, taking our waters, essentially removing Hawaiians from our native economy and forcing us into and forcing us into places like Honolulu. There are some Hawaiian language newspapers where Honolulu is described as an Aina Malihini, a foreign land, because most Hawaiians are from the, what we would now think of as the Kuihibis, from the, from the sticks. My family is actually from the Big Island, but the reason why we're not there is because we were forced to leave through various, various things, both family problems and also, you know, the, the big companies coming and taking our water and our lands. 
We're, we live now in Honolulu. Um, and the things that we now think of as the overthrow on January 17th, 1893, was really just the culmination of an entire several decades long process of our land and resources um, essentially being, being lost to us. Um, and so I would argue that economics actually precedes politics, that in, in many ways, the kind of work that like is being done at Pai Pai Ohe'ia, that is actually the primary way to regain our political independence is actually through our economic independence by restoring our ability to feed ourselves, to feed our families, you know, to feed the land by restoring fresh water to the land. That's actually the route out of our current predicament and into a more sustainable, independent future. Um, I think about our Ahupua'a system, right? Which we all, I think, have a lot of aloha for and is recognized throughout the world as, as an incredible way of managing resources and also managing people, that it was primarily an economic unit. Within the Ahupua'a, there was economic independence for all of, for that entire group of people living in that, in that triangle of land. Um, our Ohana system is also an economic unit because within that Ohana, there are people who can provide childcare. There's people who know how to fish and hunt and do all the different things that a family needs to do in order to survive. So these are economic units, which are really the basis upon which we, we, uh, we live. Um, and I think there's so much more that we should be talking about for our whole Lahui. Uh, when I think about things like our current housing crisis, Kaniela Ng has introduced a, a really good proposal about why we need housing for all. I think that we should take his idea and start implementing it here in Honolulu. I would like us to see, I would like to see us um, develop co-ops that acquire land and that build housing for our community. Take housing out of the, the realm of, you know, developers and those sorts of private interests. It should be community owned, community controlled because it should benefit our community. Uh, I think we need to look at all of the waste, all of the, I should say, all of the things that we buy and that go into the waste stream and figure out how do we build businesses based on recycling and reusing all of that material, you know? How many slippers could we make out of the plastic that we, that's going into our waste stream? Uh, how much toilet paper, which every time there's a hurricane or some kind of natural disaster, everyone freaks out, we go to Costco, we buy toilet paper. All of the office paper that gets thrown away or recycled, how much of that can we turn into toilet paper for our community? It's always nice to be able to sit here at Thomas Square and talk about toilet paper. So I would like to urge us to think not just about how do we become individual entrepreneurs, but how do we build businesses that are really for the public interest, for our community interest. Um, before I wrap up, I want to share with you something that I've always been fascinated by and I've never had the opportunity to visit, but it's the, uh, the co-ops in the Basque region of Spain. It's called, well, I pronounce it Mondragon. I'm sure that's incorrect. Uh, others might have better pronunciations, but it's a system of co-ops in which they have credit unions, uh, they have a university, they have grocery stores, they have... Um, industrial plants where they make products that they sell locally to their community and also all throughout Europe. They're able to do this entire economy and it's all worker owned. It's not the, the way that we normally think of business where there's an owner and there's people who work for the owner. No, this is something where every, every, everyone owns parts of this economy. They all benefit from it and they control it democratically. It's really an amazing model, and I'd love to see us um, figure out how do we do that here in, in Kapai Aino, Hawaii Nei. Okay, thank you very much. Aloha mai kako. Uh, my name is Benji, everybody calls me Kolu. I'm the owner and operator of Kumu Cards. Um, 
We're a pretty new company to the market. So what we do is create Olelo Hawaii uh, education tools. Um, our company was inspired by our keiki. Um, we wanted to reinforce the Hawaiian language in our home. So we took it upon ourselves to create a curriculum at home working with Kumu. Um, that way, um, you know, it's Olelo Hawaii. It's a low entry barrier for everybody, you know, from Keiki to Opio, just to build their vocabulary. And you know, that what, what we hope to do is lead more people into um, the study, you know, and, and going from not only the Olelo Hawaii, but the his, historical injustices that occurred to the Hawaiian people. So how do we channel this into a company and product? How do we educate our, our OPO and our keiki efficiently? And make sure that the pilina, which is the associations and the kauna, and the ki'i is all from us, by us. But yeah, that's, you know, that's how we started. Um, we give 10% away of our sales to Olelo Hawaii classrooms, such as Punanale Ohana, which is where we live. Um, so when we approach business, um, you know, we, for us, we stay rooted in our culture and being, in, being Aloha and Aloha Aina, um, we look for a, a way to solve the problem of not having, um, <clears throat> to have more access to Aloha Hawaii because a lot of our kiki, we don't have the ability to go to Punana Leo. You know, maybe we live outside of the district and that's a common story for so many uh, kiki. And so with our company, what we're trying to do is be able to implement in the home, um, homeschooling, you know. I think the education system is coming to an a evolution. You know, a lot of the schools now, they're going to four days a week because there's no more money. So, you know, how do we, um, how do we prop up our kiki in our own homes? And that's the, that's the problem that we, we've uh, taken on with our company, and that's... You know, we'd like to offer solutions and workbooks eventually, um, even history books. Because if you go into the DOE system, you know, how often are the keiki actually receiving the actual history that occurred? You know, they, uh, they like to um, put out the important stuff, you know, the, the real um, discrimination, you know, and the sentiment of kue. So, that's how. That's what we like to embody. Make sure where the next generation of Kiai are well informed, and they have as much access to these tools as possible. Um, yeah, that's pretty much what we do. I think in the next six months we're gonna go digital. What I hope to do is inspire uh, a new generation of Kanaka entrepreneurs, you know, to really take on this this problem, and. Uh, you know, it's, what is interesting is we see Facebook happen with these developers. Well, what happens when you blend Aloha Aina and technology, you know, and embody with Aloha, you know, and truly um, service-based businesses where we're giving back to our community. And uh, so as we grow, we, we look forward to maybe even sponsoring events like this, channel the money into our communities, um, you know, and that's... For me, I guess that's, a, that's the roots of all Aloha Aina, and you know, that's just what we're trying to do. Um, yeah, that's all I had to say. Mahalo. How about another round of applause for all of our, our speakers? Truly, truly. Now, I, to ask, I was asked to help organize um, this panel, or this tent, discussion tent. Um, we knew that Olelo Hawaii wanted uh, in this, the first panel, we had a panel that dropped out, and and, and I, as I was thinking of formalizing this next panel, is really about how can we, um, just like La Hoi Hoi Ea, in, in how they've organizing, just giving us hope. How can how can we incorporate those who have created their own business um, and stand paw on their values, um, and so. I thought of these speakers and I thought of this panel. So I want to bring, and I want to mahalo these three speakers. So right now we want to open this up uh, just for uh, Q&A.
Q&A. We've got some great amount of time, so I want to be able to um, ask the first question we got here. Uh, Doug. Yep. Hi, thanks for being here. I have a question, uh, I guess directed to Ikaika, but I think all three can answer it. Um, can a, can a ahupua kind of economy, which is basically a, a, a um, subsistence economy based on food and you know fish and kalo and that kind of stuff, can it actually exist in the kind of cash commodity kind of economy that we have now that favors things like some asshole in Chicago starting a place called Aloha Poke and then trying to sue you know Hawaii companies? I mean, can can the how Aloha how is that going to work out? He pronounces it Aloha Poke. <laughs> so I I think you know. Um, I, actually, I remember a conversation that Lynette Cruz was leading a long time ago uh, about, around the same question. And I think what came out of that conversation, which is still very applicable, is, is the notion of import substitution, which is that within the Ahupua, you basically have a closed system, right? You have all, all the pieces you need. Uh, I don't know how to deal with that guy in Chicago, but it, yeah, import substitution though is is a model that has worked in many developing countries to move from, you know, um, from relatively small GDPs to com countries like South Korea. South Korea used import substitution to get to where it is now, uh, and I think we should absolutely look at how do we apply that same philosophy to our Hawaiian economy to the to the Hawaii economy. Sure, just um, briefly, um, in the ahupua of Heia, um, we are definitely establishing that kind of ahupua system with us at Pai Pai, with Kako'o Iwi and Papahana Kuo'ola, and us uh, sharing the stream system, um, as well as um, being closely connected in the knowledge that we're sharing, um, and food production, and what that looks like, and how we're envisioning that. Um, so I think that's a great example of how it can be in the 21st century and what it can look like. Mahalo. Aloha. Um, so you're talking about the economies and I think here in Hawaii, we, you know, even though Honolulu may look uh, a lot cemented, but uh, there's a lot of art here and I think personally what we need to do is start collecting water start growing our own food you know I I think once we get to a stage where everybody is growing enough and that they have excess then you know naturally as Hawaiians what we do we feed people so I think in order to get there we got to focus on our food sovereignty you know we have tons of some fields in Kunia but yet, it's not affordable for our farmers, you know, and what, what Kiki wants to go up, and a lot of times, you know, farming is tough, you know, you either, a season will make or break you, and, um, you know, I think it starts from having Kiki, teaching them from a young age, you know, our kupuna were, were scientists, they observed uh, what moon cycles were the best to kanu, you know, they, they were intimately uh, acquainted with all the, um, the plants and trees. So I think we need to get back into that, teaching our keiki from a young age, uh, what, where their food comes from. And I think that's the basis of what our economy would be in Hawaii. Question? Next audience question. Where are we going, uncle? Aloha, everybody. I hate to say aloha. We kind of abuse the word when I was a little boy till now. We got to make sure it is the word. Okay? And this young lady here, my question is, where does she get her supplies from for the hala? Does she grow them or she buy them? Mahalo, uncle. Um, I actually 
Through um, my kumu, we take care of a lauhala patch in Kapole. So we clean it, we go visit it, uh, we make sure that we malama it, and that's where I gather from. Does that answer your question? What was your question? Um, so that's at the regional Kapole Park. So it's not my Aina thing. But through my Kumu, yeah, through that genealogy of my Kumu who have taken me on, that's the place that we malama. I have a question. Yes, here you go, Uncle. I'm not done yet. Okay. Done yet. okay. Um, what type of hala you work with? Um, can I ask the like the mana'o of what you're trying to Yeah, but is this coming from your interest in cuz are you a weaver or is this just Yeah. So the kind of hala that we work with um is the Hawaiian hala from that place. And that's what we. I think. Hey, call him my uncle. Um, ask him interject if I may. I think she answered the question pretty clearly. And in order to uh, allow for a more robust discussion in regards to our speakers, really Mahalo, I want to make sure that doesn't turn into a, a back and forth type of thing, which I kind of feel like it's getting into. If that's okay, you know, and. and but um, you can talk to me after. I'll be and, and she's definitely to open to having the, the discussion with you on the side. Um, thinking of, thinking of. Um, mahalo, Anakala. Mahalo. Um, I have a question here um, for Ashi, for, for Ben, and, and for actually for all three of you guys. But um, in regards to the logistics of getting started, which right, like I had, I need, I had this thing. I had a business. What was like the the first thing that you, like you needed to do in regards to, um, letting people know, and how do you begin to market, uh, your product or your business? Aloha. So um, Benji from Kumu Cards. Uh, how we market and how we started is pretty much grassroots. We, we started making our own flashcards for our keiki, and then, then we realized that it could be a powerful tool to be used um, in, in the home. So uh, we're real grassroots. We've probably given away more packs than we sold. You know, um, For us, it's, more, it's not about money. It's about making the resources to make sure our keiki, you know, just like in the courtroom, they're, they have access to tools, you know. They have access to uh, translators. Um, but we're on Instagram a lot, and we do giveaways, scavenger hunts. We try to be interactive with our uh, with our customers. Um, and yeah, we we just for for me, I go, I make sure I meet everybody, our, one of our customers personally. I greet them, I mahalo them, and ah, that's. It's aloha, and that's what's driving our business is people. They feel the aloha, and they, they bless us back, and that's pretty much it. You know, that's our kupuna and the kua behind us, you know. We had a vision, and they're backing us 100%. They're here with us today, and uh, yeah. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. Uh, o kou inoa Kailin Reese. O Kailin Reese, kou inoa. Um, I am a Malahini living here uh, for 17 years and working in the trade of stringed instruments, um, the restoration and building of stringed instruments. And 
the more I've learned about the influence of Hawaii and Hawaii musicians and instrument builders, designers, um, the more I feel the world has so much to learn from studying this history um, and returning credit and appreciation to many generations of island people who have shaped the modern global soundscape as we know it today. Um, so my question for you, it seems like you all are focusing on education in some way, shape, or form and kind of pushing back, you know, uh, misinformation. Um, and I'm curious how you think um, something like I'm learning could incorporate into, I mean, specifically, I love your flashcards as someone who's trying to learn Olelo. I, that's amazing. And how, in a ramshackle way, how do you think a Malahini perspective on Hawaii's contributions could incorporate into educating um, in your style, your Ohana and your Lahui, if that makes sense? It's kind of a vague question, but mahalo. Um, I think the, just getting immersed in the, the culture you know, I know a lot of people, they fall in love and they never leave. And, you know, that um, for me, um, doing Aina work is probably what I enjoy. You know, getting in Aleppo, um, going to the Kai. Um, I think the best way is to get involved and, you know, meet, meet the communities. We hope to see us all speaking Olalo Hawaii as the, you know, the, the common language of, of here, you know, and I think once we start all speaking the language, then, you know, we bring back the mana from our kupuna. Um, Olalo Hawaii is less, uh, it's more poetic, you know, it's a beautiful language to speak and visceral, you know, and uh, the Olalo Haole is oftentimes like, you read these contracts, especially in business, and it's so subversive. It's like, oh, just in case, I got to do this to watch my back, you know? And uh, I think uh, later on, the evolution is going to be aloha, aloha-based economy. You know, we, we all trust each other, and we respect each other. Um, as far as, like, getting in collaborating, you know, I work with anyone. You know, how, how can we... Um, tailor this curriculum that you're trying to develop um, to benefit the people of Hawaii, you know, and like slacky guitar and all of this is beautiful, um, beautiful um, fields of music. And how do we keep that fresh and alive to, relative to the Hamana today, you know, to keep their interest. And that's a lot of what we're doing is just kind of bringing life back into the Ike that our kupuna is. And, displaying it and, and organizing it in such a way that um, it's modern, you know, and efficient and the best technology is behind this, the, the proven data that makes learning effective. So, yeah. I don't, did I, yeah. <laughs> I just want to say a few words about your research, Kylan, because uh, we had an opportunity to talk story a few months ago, and it's really fascinating stuff that Kylan is looking at in terms of the history of, of string instruments in Hawaii and the way in which Hawaii has shaped um, the, the modern like guitar, the, the modern electric guitar, how they've actually come through this um, a, a series of players and designers here in Hawaii. And the result of that is the modern instrument that everyone plays around the world. So um, Kylan's got some really interesting things to share with everyone, I think. Um, and I also wanted to, to say uh, to to mahalo everyone who um, makes an effort to go and like learn Olelo, to, to come to events like this, to learn our history. Uh, I, I, would, I had the opportunity to hear Puake Nogomeyer once talk to, he was addressing the board of the Hawaii Tourism Authority, which gets you know, $70 million or so of public monies to go and promote Hawaii as a tourist destination, as if no one, no one knew that Hawaii was a tourist destination. Uh, I'm being sarcastic. The, and he made this amazing analogy where he said that the way that tourism works in Hawaii, and um, by extension, I think a lot of the cultural production that happens in Hawaii is that it's like you have a lychee tree and, and your neighbor goes and he picks from your lychee tree and then he goes and he sells your lychee to somebody else. So often, that's the way that our culture is used 
it's, you know, it's an artifice a lot of times. It's ornamental. It doesn't have, it is not the thing itself which people. Hi, pololei, maha oi, pololei. Hey, ai hue no hoi, you know? So I think those who are willing to, um, you know, to get involved in our community, I, I really appreciate that because, you know, it's, it's actually very common for people to move to Hawaii and have like zero interaction with Hawaii, <laughs> with Hawaiians. And so thank you for being here. Thank you for getting involved and being uh, in solidarity with our movement. Mahalo nui. I just wanted to say one more thing is that, um, you know, being Malahini, you, you guys have a different audience. You, you're, by shining light on our issues, you know, it gives us, it definitely helps us. You know, we need allies of all races and nations, you know, and I appreciate what you guys do and I look forward to collaborating, yeah. Yo, yo. Here you go. Yeah. Okay. Aloha. my sis. I didn't get your name. I just came in. Ulama. Oh, aloha. You know, I um, I've often thought about as you know, starting my own business. I've often had these thoughts of what it would look like for for us to have our own business or own. I just felt like. I wanted to have, I wanted the world to know that things are made in our kingdom, right? And, and, um, and then I would just have these dreams and thoughts about what that would look like, like not being taxed by the system, like having our own kind of, you know, like how they have the Blaisdell or something where we can, we can come and we can sell our own goods and things like that, um, made in our kingdom, right? Kind of stuff, yeah? So I... I just often thought about that. I was wondering if you had, or anybody on the panel also had any thoughts about what that could look like in a, even maybe even in a, like a barter type system. I felt like, cause I would always have these nightmares that, oh, they would come down and just shut everybody down and take all our products now. <laughs> you know, so I was wondering if you had any mana on that. I think what I heard was, can we get a sticker like made in Hawaii, but made in the kingdom of Hawaii? Yes, definitely. <laughs> um, I think it's very possible and feasible. And uh, I think when we're talking in, the, in that scope of the kingdom, um, I think those who have the aina to do that are very supportive of those things. And so we can create that, yeah? When I talk back to building power is that we can do that. And especially if you wanna have a business, uh, us as entrepreneurs, need to be creating those connections and those, um, and just help each other out and building each other up and uplifting and elevating each other and ourselves and know that it's on us. Yeah, and that's how we get this sort of the, the independent mind thought and everything that we can really work together, not think of, thinking of ourselves as competition, um, not hoarding in the knowledge that we have to create, um, but really, really coming together. Um, and learning from each other and giving each other resources. So, so yes, it is very possible. And uh, there's always going to be times when we gotta fight. But that's what that's that's the ancestral memory and everything that's within us to keep on fighting. So it's definitely feasible and possible to do. Thank you guys. That, that was good. The not hoarding trade secrets. Yeah, right on. And uh, I wanted to know from Ikaiki, you seem to have an understanding of uh, economics. If you could share something about whether currency or trade or just uh, something else, I'd like to hear more about that. Something about currency or trade. That's a tough one, huh? You're asking uh, something about currency trade. I'll give it an opportunity to defer. So I have a, my economics degree is from the University of Barnes and Noble. Uh, so I wouldn't claim to be an expert. Uh, but I do think that economics is uh, obviously, I'm not gonna, I'm just, I'm gonna end up repeating myself from earlier, that it's foundational to the way in which we 
live here. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I need more of a question. Mahalo. Aloha, Mike Ako, everybody. My name's Harvey. I'm not going to stand up because I have a camera. Okay, hi. <laughs> um, so yeah, so as far as economic development, small businesses, I think, right, they are the whole reason um, that we are able to maintain in Hawaii as a local community, right? Yeah, it's uh, economic development. What does that look like in terms of Hawaiian and vai vai? Like, I think that's even kind of what your question might be a little bit too is and with regards to economic development and the differences between some of these definitions in in the economic realm the wealth right the difference in the definition of wealth in a colonial context versus a an indigenous context what does vai vai look like I think, uh, you know, looking at the future of Hawaii and just the economic model that we have now is purely import, you know. Um, we have a lot of resources here. We have Ohe, Vai. I think the, the future Hawaii will have um, be channeling their hydroelectric water and distributing free energy to the people here. You know, the, the model of, uh, of people paying for ridiculous amounts of money for power is ridiculous. And I think right here, you know, Alexander and Baldo, and they're taking billions of gallons every day. Just imagine the Hawaiians and the people actually had equity in this, you know. And the fact of the matter is that we, we can do a lot of aina work and a lot of water work with Vai that could feed not only our whole island change, um, but like Molokai, uh, Aina Momona. You know, if we can get back to that, then, you know, there's definitely equity, you know, and it's not, prof it's not profit driven. You know, if everybody's eating, then you, you know, I think that's the real economy. And I think that's what we're getting to. I hope, I hope that kind of answers your question. So, that was a hard question. Thank you. So I, I want to say, first of all, that um, I don't actually think that capitalism and modernity have completely wiped out the indigenous economy. You look at things like uh, the ways in which extended families operate to this day, there is still that old thread of, of you know, sharing and uh, reciprocity. Um, and there's something that, Lin that Lynette Cruz has always talked about, which is that the kinds of relationships that exist within families and between families is actually more of, of an intergenerational relationship where, like over, thank you, over generations, um, people owe each other different things. And it's sort of a, it's like a, a very long-term debt that never, is, that never gets repaid. And in some ways, that's the point because we are not actually independent of each other. We're actually very much interrelated and intertwined. And that's actually a very good thing. You know, there's this, I, there's a very, uh, I don't know if it's an American idea of radical independence where, you know, you you're grow up and then you leave your family. That is not the way in, in which we were brought up, right? And so I think there's something there which is really quite old. Uh, it's really quite island. Um, look at the way that we do baby luau's. That's another example that Lynette, I'm, I'm just totally cribbing Lynette Cruz tonight, today. Uh, she talks about how the baby luau is, is, a, is a celebration of the collective wealth of, of an extended group. You know, it's the different aunties and uncles and grandparents and the neighbors and their friends and everyone comes together to celebrate this new child. And the new child is recipient of all of this aloha from their broader extended community. But it's also an opportunity for people to, to celebrate their relationships with each other. So I, I, that, I think that's really cool. Um, there are certain aspects, though, of modernity which are really important. Like, 
we live in, we, we do live at least part of the time in a cash economy. Uh, we do need things like social insurance. We need to make sure that when people are unemployed that there's money to take care of them. We need to make sure that when people are aged and um, no longer able to, to work that there is social security and all of these things which are um, admittedly artifices that are imported here but are really useful, you know? Childcare, if we can't be provided within a family, it should be available for free or for very affordable costs to people so that they can go and work and that the child has loving, attentive care. You know, there are basic things which, you know, are relatively new ideas for us here in Hawaii, but are really good for modernity. So how about a huge round of applause for our second panel speakers, really appreciate that. Now for us, I hope that inspired you guys, gave you guys some hope. Now remember that necessity is the mother of all invention. So if you got one of those mean cupcakes, halpia pies, putty next magazine or next uh, resource, next uh, weaving, something that's gonna contribute positively to our Lahui. Um, I don't care if you're on the side of the road, if you gotta do it, do it. Um, but if you want to get legit, I just want to share this resource for those of you guys who want to go out and, and, and be, take part in the, the state system. You guys can get more information from the Business Action Center that's located on Nimitz above New Eagle Cafe. Their address is 1130 Nimitz Highway, uh, number A220. So you guys, if you guys got a small business, you guys want to go up there, that's a one-stop shop. You guys, they would help you take care of all of that paperwork. Speaking from me, I know. I just was there uh, two days ago. So right on. We've got, uh, that, that concludes our second panel. Let's give another hand. And then at four, we're going to get started with our third panel, Nonviolent Direct Action, with our friends from Huli. Aloha Aina. Hey, excuse me. If anybody is interested in learning about business, you can reach out to us. You know, we're starting out ourselves, but, you know, we like to support uh, many entrepreneurs. You know, the vision is if we make a hui of business owners, then we can affect change in our community. So, you know, that's what we're all about. We're collaborating. Uh, we, I work with uh, Cover Roots, um, Keep Hawaii Hawaiian, and brother, solid entrepreneurs. And if you guys want to tap into the resources and find out how we go about it and how, um, what works best for us, if you can learn anything from us, let us know. You can reach out. Right on. So we are Cool Coal Consulting on behalf of everyone here, which is a full volunteer. Want to mahalo you guys. And you can get more information on our Facebook page at Cool Coal Consulting. Mahalo. <laughs>